Genesis 27. I will pray with you that the Lord will give us what we need, not what we deserve. A great portion of Genesis is devoted to the lives of the patriarchs. This is a book of beginnings. God gives us the beginning of the nation of Israel, the beginning of his people, with really one intention, to bring Jesus to the forefront. You know, the Bible is interested in two things, the first coming and the second coming of our, our, our Lord. That's really the focus of the scriptures. And so it begins here in this book of beginnings, and, and the Lord does so in Genesis uh, through the patriarchs, Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Joseph, And through them we get the historical kind of origins of the chosen people of Israel through whom Jesus will eventually come. In the process, however, God begins to reveal his will and his ways so that we might have learned the spiritual lessons that come from a relationship with God by faith. His plans to save, his love for man, and so much more. Well, Well, we've spent a lot of time, if you've been with us on Wednesday nights, with Abraham, who is called the friend of God. What, that's what you want to be called. There aren't too many of those. Look those up sometime. Who's been called a friend of God in the Bible? Abraham is, is in a, an elite little group, I'll tell you that. And this friend of God, we watched his, his growth in faith, uh, stumbled a little bit early on, had some doubts at times, um, but had great victories in the Lord. We, we, we saw the birth of his son at age you know, 100 after a 25-year wait, and then saw his, his son being taken to be sacrificed at Mount Moriah, Genesis 22 where you get the feeling of the father's heart in the sacrifice of his son. You don't get that. You get the, you get the, 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 the report of it in the Gospels. You get the, the understanding of God, the father's heart in, in Genesis 22. You get the heart of the son in Psalm 22, where he cries out, my, my God, why have you forsaken me? And he's left alone to suffer for our sins. So, we went with Isaac there, and at 25 years old, when his dad at 125 said, you know, I'm going to sacrifice you, he submitted himself to the will of his father. God then provided a, a lamb as a sacrifice. And so we watched Isaac's highs, if you will. And then we, we only spent a couple of chapters with Isaac, because Isaac is the kind of guy, and tonight we, we'll kind of run out of Isaac. We'll pick him up when he dies, but this is pretty much it for Isaac tonight. Um, but but he's, he's a very interesting fella. It just just seems to have tremendous highs. Early on, he was with his dad at 25, Genesis 22, just seemed to be thriving spiritually. By the time you get to this chapter, he has hit a low mark in his life. Uh, By the time we get to chapter 28, God will turn all of our attention, not to Abraham, not to Isaac, but now to Jacob, and we'll spend the better part of 12 or 13 weeks with Jacob, uh, having a lot to learn um, through him and and, and from him. and the Lord will teach us, I think, how, how the Lord can get someone who strives in his own strength to get ahead and relies on his own abilities, how even he can be broken and be used by God. So we'll spend a, a lot of time with Jacob in the next couple of weeks, and we'll start in earnest next week. But this is, this is Isaac's last hurrah. He was 75 years old when his dad died, Abraham. He was 40 when he got married to Rebecca. For 20 years, he and her prayed for children. She was barren and unable to bear children. He's, he still seems to be a pretty decent guy. He's, he's seeking the Lord for his wife and his family. But at 60 years old, they have twins. And as the striving in her womb, Rebecca begins to seek the Lord, and the Lord speaks of these twins, and he, he says that the birthright of that cherished possession and that cherished place was to go to Jacob, who was born second. It would go to the younger. Esau was born first. He was called Esau. He was red and hairy. Jacob was called Jacob because he had his brother's heel in his hand. He was, I think, trying to get ahead of him. Like, that's pretty much Jacob early on. Um, They called him heel catcher. But the Lord specifically laid out for them that this was going to be God's choice. The blessing, the leadership, the the name, and the, the descendancy would go through Jacob, the younger, not Esau, the elder, as would be the typical practice, if you will. Um, And God often reverses the practice in the scriptures just to, I think, let us know he's the Lord, you know? You can have a certain way to do things, and most of the time that's right, but God has a way of just stepping in. So uh, the birthright brought a double portion to the successor as far as inheritance. It it put him in direct lineage by name with with the Messiah, and he became the high priest of his home. He became the responsible party for everything spiritual, for everything uh, civil. You know, he was the, the head of his home, and he was the one who was to direct the family. Uh, Esau, you might remember in chapter 25, sold it to Jacob for a pot of stew. 
because he'd come home empty-handed one night and was starving. I'm going to die. What good is a birthright if I'm dead? Here, just trade. Spade lemonade. So he traded it. And that'll come into play tonight. We also uh, looked in detail, I think, in chapter 25 at Isaac's faithlessness and how God was still faithful, even when Isaac was just running around and running away and, and spending time in places amongst the Philistines he didn't really need to be. Uh, but God was still faithful. Uh, we, we ended last time's study at the end of chapter 26 by reading that uh, Esau, was, at 40 years of, old, uh, of age, got married to uh, two women from a heathen nation. And, and we read in verse 34 and 35 that it broke his parents' heart. So though Isaac had kind of wandered away from the Lord, there was still that sense of right and wrong in his heart. You know, he, he, he was grieved by his boy's response because he was his favorite. Jacob had his mom as you know, his, her favorite, but there was this favoritism in the home that is going to kind of work itself out tonight. Uh, between chapter 26 and 27, there is roughly 37 years of no report. We don't know anything. We're not told anything. The story just picks it up. But tonight is our, like I said, our last real view of Isaac. But it's set in, in, in the picture of his family, four people in all. Isaac, his beautiful, or at least once beautiful wife, Rebecca, and their twin sons, Jacob and Esau. And there is this glaring truth as we read this, that this is the epitome of a messed up family. This is dysfunction at its finest, at its most dysfunctional. No one trusts each other. There is tremendous favoritism. We read about it in chapter 25, verses, I think, 27 and 28. The favoritism had pretty much separated the spouses so that mom and, and, and her favorite and dad and his favorite kind of work together. Isaac doesn't trust Jacob, doesn't trust his wife. Esau despises Jacob. Esau clutches to his father. And that problem in the family, that dysfunction, that, that weirdness that's going on, and then the will of God that had been expressed to them 77 years ago, was that God would bless Jacob and use him as the firstborn, and that comes into play tonight as well. Um, the, old shall, the older shall serve the younger now comes into play. So that was God's choice. Now, Isaac, we will find tonight, feels like he's going to die. And so before he dies, he wants to be sure to bless his favorite boy, Isaac. Even though God had said, Jacob would receive the blessing of the firstborn. Isaac, his father, old guy now, has determined that that's not the way it's going to be. He's going to dig in his heels. He's going to absolutely oppose God's will, though he knew it very well. And then his wife, who also knows God's will and is happy with it because that's her favorite boy, is now going to step in and say, well, whatever it takes, whatever God wants, at all costs, the end will justify the means. I'm going to be sure that God's will is done and that my boy Jacob gets the blessing that God intends for him to have. That's kind of this messed up family here. The cool lesson in all of this weirdness, and you'll see how weird it gets, is that God is able to function in it to accomplish his will. So on the one hand, it's a pretty sad story of a family that doesn't do very well. On the other hand, there is this glorious truth that God uses messed up people and overrules their weirdness and still has his will. That makes me feel real good, doesn't it, you? Because you look at people and you go, really, you guys are messed up. But then you go, well, God will still fix it, you know? God will still work. And it's certainly true here in, in, the, in the midst of lies and deceit and selfishness and stupidity in a family headed for the Jerry Springer show, because that's this family. <laughs> this is a Jerry Springer family moment. I like the fact that God uses the foolish to confound the wise and the weak things of the world to put to shame the mighty. Yet we hardly wonder how it got this way in the family when Isaac lies to his dad. Now mom and dad are in, in cahoots with their kids to deceive. This kind of runs in the family. This is a family trait. They've been at this for years. Uh, I, I think C.S. Lewis, kind of tongue-in-cheek years ago, said, you know, a little lie is like being a little pregnant. It, it may not show immediately, but trust me, it soon will. And that's kind of what this whole story is about. Unfortunately, uh, though God is good and will, through all of that, still get what he wants, his will will not be shifted or, or hindered. Um, the repercussions of the, the disobedience and the sinfulness, you're still required to live with, even though God gets his will. 
So on the one hand, God's will isn't thwarted. On the other hand, if we're not going to be willing to line up with what God wants, we're going to suffer the consequences without moving him one inch in either direction. We'll hurt, he'll still get his way. Or we can line up and be blessed, and being blessed we can go with God, but, but the consequences here are not good, and we'll even run into a few of them tonight before we finish at the end of the chapter. So here's this battle between Esau and Jacob. It's really their third battle. Remember, they fought first in the womb. Two nations are fighting within your womb. They were womb mates, you remember, right? Um, and they struggled together. The second one was in that sale of his birthright for a pot of stew. And that's the focus again tonight. Who gets the birthright? Who gets the blessing? Who gets that place of honor? What is God's will? What is man's will? How is that going to work out? And, uh, you know, the favorite parents face off. So Isaac, he has his favorite boy, Esau, who likes to read, read Field and Stream, you know? And then Rebecca, she's got Jacob, who loves Martha Stewart, you know, and learns how to cook. And they both love their kids. And they're both a messed up bunch of people. In fact, I'll say this to you going in before we get out here in the chapter tonight. The only guy that comes out of here tonight in a spiritual sense is Isaac. Everyone else is still scheming. Isaac finally gets it, ends up in Hebrews 11, chapter of faith. Finally gets it. So, four people, and I want you to write them down if you're a note taker. First of all, we'll look at the unspiritual father, Isaac, verse 1. Now it came to pass when Isaac was old, his eyes were so dim that he could not see that he called Esau, his older son, to him, my son. He answered, here I am. And he said, behold, now I am old. I don't know the day of my death. Therefore, please take your weapons and your quiver and your bow. Go out to the field. Hunt game for me. Make me that savory food such as I love. And bring it to me that I may eat and that my soul may bless you before I die. Now Isaac was sick, old, blind, bedridden, and believes he is about to die. By the way, he is 137 years old. His brother Ishmael died at 137 years old. So I'm sure that Isaac figured that in. Oh, you know, I got parental things. We all die about 137 around here. And he starts to worry about his life. He's, he's blind now. He's slowed down. And, you know, Isaac, I'm sure, is computing it in his head. Maybe he's a bit of a hypochondriac. I don't know. You know, he's the guy that went to the internet, the web MD, you know, and he, he pretty much has every fatal illness and symptom there. On his tombstone, I'm sure, were the words, I told you I was sick, you know. <laughs> That's, that's the kind of Isaac, because in actuality, Isaac is going to live 43 more years. He's going to get to be 180. So 43 years before he thinks, before he dies, he thinks he's gone. So he's not the first guy to be a little bit like that. Uh, and, and we'll see that in Genesis 35, but it'll be a while. So he believes that he's dying. That's the case. And, and what he wants to do is have one final bit of that wonderful deer meat, you know, or whatever he's cooking for, Isaac's cooking for his dad, that venison, so that he can have it, and then, oh, and then I can bless you, and then, you know, my work will be done as the father, and I can and go ahead and die. Um, Esau loved this idea. He was going to get to buy back with a dish of venison what he had lost for buying a, a pot of stew. So he, he's, he's all into this. This is perfect. Um, now, not to upset your Sunday school view of the Bible, and sometimes you bring those to the Old Testament. But both Esau and Jacob are 77 years old here. These are not young kids. These are grandmas and grandpa ages, you know? And they're just, and the parents are 50 years old or 60 years older, and you know, oh my. I know, it kind of ruins the picture a little bit. But anyway. <laughs> How wrong it has gone for Isaac, I can only imagine. You know, it's been 112 years since he was up there in Genesis 22 at Moriah with his dad, saying, oh, whatever the Lord wills. Son, I might have to put this knife in your chest, whatever the Lord wants, because we trust God. Yes, we do. And, and to this, hey, Esau, come here. I think I'm dying. Go get me some stew, man. I'm going to bless you. Okay, dad. Unspiritual dad, for sure. And, you know, if, if he was a picture of the of the spiritual, you know, submitted young man at 25, he's the picture of a backslidden believer now. He's set in his ways. He's all about his flesh. He wants to circumvent the will of God by, by, by choosing his preference. Um, but, but he's not the last guy to do that. I'm sure in your own life you can say to yourself, there's a lot of times I've known exactly what God wanted to do, but I was about to do just the opposite. 
You know, forgive them. Forgive them. I'll kill them. Right? We, we, we love them. I hate them. Deny yourself. Deny myself. I've denied myself for years. Now it's my turn. It's my time. We, 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 we often fight with the will of God. Well, Esau is in that position too, but he's an unspiritual father for sure. Second of all, we look at his wife, Rebecca, the unsurrendered wife. Verse 5. Now Rebecca was listening when Isaac spoke to Esau, his son, and Esau went out to the field to hunt game to bring it in, and Rebekah spoke to Jacob, her son, and said, Indeed, I heard your father speaking to Esau, your, your brother saying, Bring me game, make me savory food, and I may eat it and bless you in the presence of the Lord before my death. Now therefore, my son, obey my voice according to what I command you. Go now to the flock, bring me from there two choice kids of the goats, and I'll make some savory food from them for your father such as he loves, and you can take it to your father that he may eat it, and he may bless you before his death. Unspiritual father, not a good leader, given up his position as spiritual head of his home, and a very unsurrendered wife. She is one who feels she has to fight her way through all of this, including her you know, oldest son by a couple of minutes, and her husband. Notice in verse 5, 6, and 7 that it seems that Rebecca was eavesdropping on her husband's conversation with her son. She hadn't been invited to this conversation. She wasn't in the same room with them. But she doesn't trust them. So, hey, oh, they're meeting in the living room. And she sneaks over nearby and she listens. And she quickly determines by what she hears that whether it takes hook or crook, that her favorite son Jacob will that day be leaving with the blessings of his father Isaac and not that other son Esau. After all, God told me 77 years ago that this was his will. Right? He knows it. I know it. We know it. We all know it. I'm going to have to do whatever it takes to be sure that God is honored in this house. So, buddy, come here. And like Sarah uh, with Hagar years earlier, back in, what, chapter 16 or so, Rebecca truly believed that somehow it takes help from us to accomplish the will of God. Now, please don't ever come to that conclusion. God does never need your help. God can get along without you for the rest of eternity. He won't go, oh, I hope he steps in and helps. That, that critical, there is no critical time for God. There is no day of, uh, uh, you know, of, of no return. <laughs> there isn't that, that, that line that now has been crossed, it's too late. But, but Rebecca is, is absolutely sure that, that she needs to help the Lord out. And, you know, it's like that old worldly proverb, God helps those who help themselves. That's always a losing proposition in the Bible. And even here, you know, you can read the story and come away saying, well, at least God's will was done. But, but then you have to wonder, could God's will have been done anyway? Because now in, in, in messing with what God wanted to be doing, everyone suffers in the end. Everyone hurts and loses. There's, there's tremendous loss. God's will is still done, mind you. But it could have been done with great joy. What it was accomplished with was great hurt, great anger, great bitterness, Great separation, great difficulty. So um, it, it is not a good thing to, to go into any situation doing what you think you have to do, even if it's sinful, with the explanation, well, this is what God wants. I know he does. We had a kid when I was a young kid in, in, in church when I first got saved at, at 19, and he would bring all of his friends to church by lying to them. He'd say, dude, you want to go check out this movie? It's a great movie. Yeah, and he'd bring them to church, and they'd get mad. But a couple of them got saved. They heard the Bible. So you go, hey, but they got saved. Dude, you lied to them. What kind of a witness are you? Well, the Lord saved them. Yeah, the Lord will work despite you being a donkey. You know, God will still work. But you're hor you, that doesn't work that way. That's not the way God ever works. It's nothing God will ever bust. Don't get the wrong. Now, presume what God sometimes says, it's okay for me to lie. It's not okay for you to lie. It's not okay to deceive. But we're doing the will of God. Great. Then do it honestly. <laughs> do it in the Lord's way. Do it in a way that honors him. Well, she thought otherwise. And, and, and I know that believers who know the Bible sometimes will argue that the end justifies the means. And as long as God's will is accomplished, well, that's all that we're really looking for. But remember when Paul wrote to the Romans, I think it was in chapter 6, and he says, well, what, what can we say then? Sh should sin abound so that grace could much more abound? God forbid. That's not the way it works, right? 
So, so here's a woman, this unsurrendered wife, who for years has had great difficulty with her husband and with her kids and has taken sides, who has a promise from God that favors the son that she favors. And so she's happy about that. He's not. It's all about submitting to the will of God. And now she believes if she doesn't intervene, God's will will not be accomplished. Absolute stupidity. Of course God will accomplish his will. Like I said, he doesn't need us at all. So Re Rebecca should have done what? Well, here's my suggestion to Rebecca. She should have just submitted to her husband and then went to talk to the Lord. Even maybe sat down with her husband and said, look, I heard you talking to our son. Look, I, I know you like him better than this other boy. I know you got favorites. We've all had problems. But look, this is God's will. And we can't oppose God's will. Or we're going to fight with God and he'll still have his way. And, and then go pray. That's what she should have done. That's not at all what she did do. But that's certainly what would have helped her to discover the will of God without suffering. Just like Isaac, though, she is guilty of lying and deceiving, not trusting the Lord. And so Esau goes out hunting, and so will Jacob, as he's about to act it all out for his mom's sake. She's now his director. Learn from this, if nothing else, that if you know the will of God, you should never set out to accomplish the will of God by a work of the flesh. That those never fit together. I know that in, in, in a common sense standpoint, we, we can justify a lot of that behavior. Biblically, that doesn't work. You know, When Moses was told by the Lord at some point in his life he was going to be the deliverer of his people from Egypt, you know, there came a time when he thought, as he watched one of the Israelites being abused by an Egyptian, and he stepped in, he thought, well, if I take care of this, the people will recognize that God has called me, and so he kills this guy. But rather than recognizing him, they all ratted him out. That's the guy that killed the Egyptian. There he goes. And Moses went running to the back of the, the wilderness desert for 40 years to learn that God would do things God's way, not Moses' way. God's will would still be accomplished. You just can't make that happen for yourself. And, and we, we see that a lot of times people go, I believe God's calling me to music. And you'll say, well, great. I'm sure the Lord will open doors. And then they start calling everybody and, and, and just marketing themselves and pushing themselves forward and not waiting at all upon the Lord. And they may get where they want to be, but are they right where God wants them to be? Probably not. Because if, if the Lord is in something, the Lord will open the doors. It's harder to wait. It, it's just the right thing to do. You know, it's just the right thing to do. So... You know, here we find this woman. I think David did the same thing in, in getting that, that ark from the Philistine countryside. You know, he, he wanted to do the right thing. Let's bring the Lord's presence and the place of worship back to Jerusalem. Great call. That's exactly where the Lord wanted to be. What did, what did David do? He brought a couple of guys and a worship team and a cart. And All right, you can read about it there in 2 Samuel, I think it's chapter 6. And, you know, they got the tambourines out and the, they're playing the drums. Everybody's pretty, yeah, we're going to bring the Lord back and... You know, the cart starts to wiggle on the road and it starts to tip and this fellow Uzzah reaches forth and he's, oh, let me just get that. And now he touches the Lord's presence. Bad idea. And he absolutely drops dead. And old David, like, oh, he is so bummed. Thanks, Lord. I'm trying to do a good thing. And here, look what you did. And he left it there for months. And wherever the Lord's presence was, that place got blessed. But David was just, and he finally learned that it was the right thing to do, but not in the right manner. So he went back and he, he read the scriptures and he learned that, you know, the, that he was supposed to bring it back in God's will and it had nothing to do with a cart. You had to have staves that went through the hooks and the hooks, staves had to be on the shoulders and had to be two priests in the front and two priests in the back. And you had to, you know, nobody looked and you, you covered it up and here you went. That's the way the Lord wanted it. It's his presence. You're sinful. So he came back and, and you know, he followed God's prescribed method and, and, and he did the will of God. In fact, if you go back and read the, the story there, David had these men take six steps, just six steps, one, two, three, four, five, six, stop, built an altar, offered a sacrifice, Worship the Lord, went six more steps. They did this for six miles. David's taken no chances. But he wanted to do it right, you know. Uh, it was it efficient? No. It took a long time. Was it effective? Absolutely. Why? Because his will doesn't need your help. You need his help, right? It, it applies to, to churches, too. I, I heard someone say that, that, that the analogy that... that you know, a, a church sometimes is nothing more than, or a cart is nothing more than boards with big wheels. And they applied it to the church and they said, you know, a lot of Christian organizations, they might start seeking God and God opened doors, but they end up just with board members and big names, get the ball rolling. They trust in so many other things, not in the Lord. The cart now comes 
before the horse, so to speak, right? And, and now we plan it all out, and God can't do a thing. Well, we're, we're accomplishing God's will. We're gathering, we're getting thousands to show up. Big deal. What is happening in the hearts of the people? That's what God wants to, to look at and what wants us to see. So I think we have to wait on the Lord, and he'll, he'll, he'll accomplish his will. He doesn't need, I, I guess that's the lesson, he doesn't need your help. Well, anyway, she says to Jacob, I'll tell you what, go get a couple of goats. Now, goats don't taste like deer, right? Go get game, and she goes, go get goats. So she must have been a pretty good cook. But she was going to try to make goat with the right spices taste like deer meat stew, which is what Esau was so famous for, and his dad just absolutely loved. He must have loved it. He wanted that to be his last meal, right? So we have an unspiritual father, an unsurrendered mother, and then we come to Jacob, and we'll call him the unscrupulous brother. Verse 11, let's read. And Jacob said to his mother, Rebekah, look, Esau, my brother, is a hairy man. I am a smoothie. That's pretty much what he says there. It's only there's really only one word there. Perhaps my father will feel me, and I shall seem to be a deceiver to him, and I shall bring a curse on myself and not get a blessing. Now, I want you to notice about our little hero here, the unscrupulous brother, that Jacob's only concern is what? Whether he gets caught or not. Isn't that what he says to his mom? Look, mom. He doesn't say, I don't know if the Lord would like that. I don't know if that's the will of God. Can't we let God handle this? All he says is, mom. We're like night and day. He's a hairy guy. I got no hair anywhere. I can't even grow a beard. I'm 77. I got nothing. Esau, he's got it growing out his toes, his armpits. It's everywhere. This will never work. And look what he says here in verse 12. If my father feels for me, I might seem to be a deceiver to him. You might seem to be a deceiver to him. And not only that, I'm going to lose that blessing. I'm going to get a curse. I'm not going to get a blessing. I, I love the fact that, that Jacob doesn't seem to mind being a see, deceiver. He just doesn't want to be seen as one. Now, we laugh at that, but I'm thinking, there's a lot of people like that. Aren't there? They are more interested in what they seem to be than what they really are. And, and, and what will people think of me? And, and the bottom line is, who cares what people think of you? What does the Lord think of you? What, what matters is what God thinks of you. Well, not Jacob. Jacob is only interested in what, you know, his dad is going to think and how much that's going to cost him. So um, there's a big difference between reputation and character, you know? Reputation is what you seem to be. It's what people think of you. It's what people say of you. It's what, what's on the outward. You can formulate reputation. You can... You can shape reputation. You can manipulate reputation. You've been watching any of these conventions. They do a lot of that, right? Here's what we seem to be. Oh, okay. That's what we want you to think about. That's, that's what we want our reputation to be. And then there's character, which is what you truly are when no one's watching. What you really are. Pull away the veneer. Pull away you know, all of the cover. That's what you truly are. Character is who you are when no one else is around. Jacob's worry is about seeming to be a deceiver. He doesn't want people to get the wrong impression of him. No, 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 that's not true. He doesn't want people to get the right impression of him. I don't want them to know who I really am. And I would say to Jacob, Jacob, buddy, I wouldn't worry about that. You're way past that. You are a deceiver with a capital deceive, you know? So... Rebecca, verse 13, assures him, and his mother says to him, look, let your curse then be upon me, my son. Only obey my voice and go get them for me. I, I just can't get the picture of this old woman yelling at her 77-year-old boy, just go get the goats. I'll take the responsibility. Okay, mom. Mama's boy indeed. Verse 14. And he went and he got them, brought them to his mother. His mother made some savory food, such as his father loved. And Rebekah then took the choice clothes of her older son Esau, which were with her in the house, put them on Jacob, her younger son. And she also put the skins of some kids of the goats on his hands, on the smooth part of his neck. See, Esau must have been one hairy dude, right? And then she gave the savory food and the, and the bread, and she prepared it, and she gave it into Jacob's hands. So she prepares the meal. I, I like the words Jacob has given some of Esau's choice clothes because the word choice literally means to smell. Like choice, like, like B.O., like you smell sweaty. You're, you're the outside stinky guy. You smell of the woods, you know? Oh, you've been, uh, that smells like Esau. So let's have you put those on. That'll help because dad is blind, but he can smell okay, you know? 
He's got the locker room smell. You know, and Jacob Learsley smells like Giorgio Armani, I'm thinking. This guy hangs around the house, right? So, he, and then for a final touch, he wears goat hair on his arms, on his neck, where dad might get a hold of him. She's got him like this, dressed up. Dad can't see, and Jacob's got to look just silly, right? And now he's got to go in, you know, smoothie. Gets to go resemble Harry to fool daddy. This is Academy Award stuff, right? You know you're going to want to see this video when you get to heaven. Well, so he goes into his father and he says, my father, and he says, here I am. Who are you, my son? <laughs> and Jacob says to the other, oh, I'm Esau, your firstborn. <laughs> I don't know if he tried that or not. I've done just what you told me. Please arise, sit and eat of my game that your soul may bless me. And Isaac said to his son, how is it that you found it so quickly, my son? He said, oh, the Lord your God has brought it to me. Uh, Jacob does a stellar performance. Produced by his mother, getting in the credits, uh, to try to fool his father, and supposedly, remember, don't lose track of this, to accomplish God's will. That's the, the bottom line. We've got to get God's will done. Uh, note the lies that are told. E even bringing the name of the Lord into it, right? Five lies in one sentence. I am Esau. I'm your firstborn. I've done what you told me. Here is the game. The word is venison. It is not. That's goat meat. And finally, God has blessed me. That's why I was able to get... This guy can lie in complete sentences, right? His mom had taught him well. Well, this guy is a spiritual fraud now that is bringing the name of the Lord into his conversation to further his agenda, right? In every biblical sense, this is taking the name of the Lord in vain. <laughs> More than swearing, this is it. This is using God's supposed involvement to move forward your own agenda. How did you get that food so quickly? How were you able to hunt down that deer? Oh, Dad, God stuck a deer right in front of me, and that was it. Now, I can't begin to tell you how often we have run into people in the church or, or that approach the church who want help from us, want to come play, want to come speak, and they will end or begin the conversation by saying, and then the Lord told me to call you. So that really you are now at odds, because what do you say to the Lord told me? Um, except, here's what I say, well, the Lord hasn't told me. That's about the only way out, because what do you do with people who say, the Lord was with me in this? You don't want to go, well, pfft, you just probably got lucky. You don't do that. You know, you, you want the Lord to be in, in people's lives in that sense. So, but, but folks will use the name of the Lord to support or to help their cause. And it is very difficult um, to deal with people like that. You know, when, they, when you're in counseling and, and they ask for advice and you tell them exactly what the Bible teaches and they'll say, well, the Lord told me otherwise, you want to just go, well, how is that possible? This is his word. But they, they rest in this, well, the Lord spoke to me. I had a man... 30 years ago, come to me and say, hey, I found the right wife. I said, what about the wrong wife you're married to? <laughs> he said, the Lord brought her to me. I said, the Lord of hell maybe brought her to you, but not the Lord of heaven. But he, even he, in all of his wickedness, wanted to somehow involve God and, and, and say, well, the Lord did What can I do? The Lord did this. I mean, the Lord, they called, they came over. I don't know why. The Lord must have been in it. It was so coincidental. Really? That's taking the name of the Lord in vain, isn't it? And, and I must tell you, I have seen some, the Lord lead people into some very stupid things, if it's the Lord. Well, the Lord told me to do that, and then things fall apart. Was that the Lord? Well, I think it was the Lord. I don't know. But look, here, here's the problem in the family. No one trusts each other. Everyone around here hustles, you know, and, and hustles themselves. You can already tell Isaac's not sure, can't you? Who are you? Because the voice doesn't sound quite right. How'd you get here so quickly? He's already given him the third degree. I don't trust anyone. I wish I could see. All I can do is smell and hear. And so, you know, he's afraid. And, and I suspect that you know, as Jacob is standing there and his father is questioning him, that that lump in his throat is getting bigger and he's thinking, I'm going to get cursed. Mom's going to have to carry it. She said she'd take care of it. Oh man, this is a bad idea. But he's committed now. He's got like goat hair on and goat stew that tastes like deer meat, you know. 
Verse 21, then Isaac says to Jacob, could you come near to me that I might feel you, my son, whether you're really my son Esau or not? This is a great family. I just like to see if you're hairy or not. And so Jacob now, with great trepidation, goes forward to Isaac, his father, and he feels him. He said, the voice is Jacob's, but the hands are Esau's. But he didn't recognize him because his hands were hairy like his brother Esau's. And so he blessed him and he said, are you really my son Esau? And he said, I am. See, the old blind Isaac was used to ruses and half-truths. This family was all about that, right? So he has to be careful because he can't see. And Jacob couldn't fully disguise his voice. Like I said, he probably, oh, he saw, I tried to fake his brother's voice, you know. The hair on his, on his hands and neck, the, the, the goat hair were apparently a little bit more convincing. But notice in verse 24 that Isaac is still tremendously unsure. Uh, but he goes ahead based on his feelings. He disregards the voice. He goes by what he feels. Isn't that interesting? Our feelings can certainly betray us, can't they? He goes by what he feels, not by what he senses in his heart, by what he hears. Your feelings will let you down a lot. God's word will never let you down. So if you're, if you're looking to grow spiritually, you certainly want to establish your heart not based on how you feel, but upon what God says. Because feelings tend to change with circumstance, you know? You know, you're on vacation, you always feel better, don't you? You get a raise, you feel better. You had a big meal, you feel better. Your favorite TV program's on, you're feeling all right. It's hot outside and you're at the beach and you're surfing, the waves are big, you couldn't feel any finer. But then it gets cold and windy and and you're not eating and and you don't feel well, Then, then your whole attitude changes. You can't live by your feelings. Isaac went by his feelings. He felt, he went, oh, oh yeah, that, all right, I guess I can put the fact that he's got a squeaky voice out of my head. And he doesn't sound a bit like Esau, he sounds like that little pansy Jacob, mama likes so much. <laughs> That's how he felt about him, right? But, you know, he feels like he's the right guy, so I've got to go by that. And, and, and boy, how, how difficult for us to grow spiritually, but how easy it is to go by your feelings when you're separated from God in your heart. So... Um, you hear people sometimes sharing what, 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 what they believe about God, but it isn't based upon the scriptures. It's based upon how they felt last night at the meeting, you know. Oh, and then the Lord said this, and I got goosebumps, and then I was slain in the spirit. Really? Is that the biblical practice that you want to follow? Feelings will mislead you. They're fallible. The scriptures will not. The word that he heard caused him to stop. The feelings that he got from the hands and from the neck of his, uh, you know, unscrupulous son... Um, convinced him to go ahead. Well, then verse 25, he said, well, then bring it near to me and I will eat of my son's game so that my soul may bless you. And so he brought it near to him and he ate. And Apparently, Rebekah did a good job. And he brought him wine and he drank. And his father Isaac said to him, now come near me and kiss me, my son. Oh no, one more test. And he came near and kissed him and he smelled the smell of his clothing. <laughs> this guy's just not let go. So this was the last test, the kiss me smell test. Right? I, he can't sneak that in. I guess that was okay. Because the carnal man is blind. He goes by his senses, right? By what he touches, by what he feels, his instinct, his smell. He's fooled by them all. And, and, and that's Isaac here. And now he's going to bless. But who is he thinking he's blessing? He thinks he's blessing Esau, right? I'm going to defy God, defy God's will that I've known for three quarters of a century, and I'm going to do what I want to do. Now, before we read on, let me ask you to think about this. Do you think God intended to bless Jacob with their birthright? The answer is an obvious yes, right? You can go back and read it a few chapters earlier. Everyone in the family know it. uh, And the only way that we can come out of experiencing God in our lives with joy is to let him bring that to pass. Be obedient, submit ourselves to his will, and let him bring those things to pass, even when the circumstances look like it's going to forbid or prohibit exactly what we know God wants to do. Oh, but that, how are we going to do it? I don't know. I'll give you a good example of what we run into sometimes, um, or what we have run into in the past, and you've probably heard them as well. We get a lot of letters for people looking for financial support, even from the radio, because if you're on the radio on a, on a station in, in the Midwest or back East, there are people who will take that whole playlist or, or, or 
ministry list and they will start to write letters. Well, I'm in the Philadelphia area and I listen to you on the radio. I know you care about radio and I also, and we're on uh, two hours after you, four hours before you, six hours later. Um, never did get a letter from Philadelphia, by the way, so it's a good example. Uh, but they will say, could you just send us some dough? Could you send us some money? Would you help us, you know? Could, could you? Because else we're going to have to go off the air and we know God wants us to be on the air. So that puts a lot of pressure on me, right? I don't want them to go off there. If that's the will of God, so do I do. Well, I just say to them, look, if the Lord wants you to be on the air, he'll provide a way for you to stay on. But if, if the way that you can stay on is by putting pressure on everyone, that even from folks you don't know, hundreds of letters, thousands of letters to people you have no idea who they are, just give me money, give me some more money, I need more money, then you're probably not in a place where God is meeting your needs. You know, you could be a, a guy that's just running a business and, and, and working people up into a fervor. How do you know that the Lord wants you on the air? I said, here's what we do. We pay our bills, and if we don't have the money, we get off the air. And we trust the Lord's going to provide, or we're going to quit. We don't ask for money. We don't seek money. We seek Jesus. And he blesses his word, and we've been doing it for 30 years. And then they go, oh, I don't know how that is. That's, you know, we can't do that back east. Really? Oh, okay. You can't do that back east. That makes perfect sense. Clear now as a bell, you know. Look, God's purposes are going to stand. Nothing can prevent his will from being accomplished. So you can quit trying to accomplish his will or help him by scheming or by politicking, or by conniving, or trying to make friends in the right places. And one of Jacob's greatest lessons from his life is that he absolutely does that for the next 20 years. He connives. And it isn't until he stops conniving that he can become God's man. Even though he's been God's man all along. God had a plan. God had a purpose. He just delayed the inevitable by 20 years, and he brought great suffering into his life as a result. So, so God's will your will and submitting to him are, are both needed if you're going to find yourself where God wants you to be. So, uh, but you can sure dig a big hole for yourself in sin by doing otherwise and uh, bring sad consequences upon you. So, you know, Isaac, one test after the other, all right, but he, 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 he's doing the wrong thing. <laughs> and he thinks he's going to get away with it. Well, here's the blessing that he now gives to his son, the firstborn, verse 27, in the middle. Surely the smell of my son is like the smell of a field. That sounds great. Which the Lord has blessed. Therefore may God give to you of the dew of heaven, of the fatness of the earth, the plenty of grain and wine. Let people serve you. Let nations bow down to you. You be the master over your family or your brethren. Let your mother's sons bow down to you. And cursed is everyone who curses you. And blessed be those who bless you. So the blessing of the firstborn, unlimited power and prosperity, lordship over his brethren, divine protection from God, a blessing for the one who would submit. It sounds very much like the promises of God that he made to Abraham. Well, Jacob walks out of that room like this to his mom. We, we did it, man. Dumb old dad. High five. You are right, praise the Lord. But on the heels of this ruse comes our fourth character. We've labeled him the unsaved son because this guy is way out there. Now it happened as soon as Isaac had finished blessing Jacob and Jacob had scarcely gone out from the presence of Isaac, his father, that Esau, his brother, came in from his hunting. And he had also made this savory food and brought it to his father and said to his father, let my father arise Eat of his son's game, that your soul may bless me. And, and his father Isaac said to him, who are you? He said, I'm your son, your firstborn, I'm Esau. And Isaac trembled exceedingly. He said, who? Where is the one who hunted game and brought it to me? I ate all of it before you came. I've blessed him, and indeed, he shall be blessed. Now, this is a... a a moment of tremendous rude awakening for Isaac. Read the words again, trembled exceedingly. Why? Because the truth of what he had tried to do and God had put an end to it sunk in. In fact, the Holy Spirit adds the words there at the bottom, and indeed he shall be blessed, because Isaac at this point, it seems, was absolutely determined that he would not try to defy the Lord again. I think he realized 
You know, oh my gosh, I almost did it. I almost offended God. But I didn't. I didn't. And so in this mix of weirdness, his heart becomes soft. And you can read of him in chapter 11, verse 20 of Hebrews, by faith Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau concerning things to come. By faith, well not early on, not what we just read, but here, when he realizes he's been found, he's been caught, he's been busted, it didn't work. His conniving, his planning, maybe for years, his determination to have things his way. But, but very terse words in Hebrews 11. By faith, Isaac blessed both Jacob and Esau concerning their future, concerning things to come. So, great lesson to learn that God will work despite you. Now, you read this and you want to say to yourself, well, it sure sounds like Jacob and Rebecca had their way. Lies and deception worked. Well, Hebrews says... It is now an action of faith upon Isaac's part that he leaves the blessing the way it was. He could have retracted it because it was deceptive. He could have said, okay, I was fooled. That was my intention. You know, you can't hold me to that. But he doesn't. He, he leaves it the way that it is solely because he realizes that God is in this thing. What is that Proverbs, I think it's 1921, says the plans of a man's heart. Are, there are many plans in a man's heart, but the Lord's counsel will stand. Right? So you can either get in line or, or stay a, a, away, but, but God's plan is still going to be accomplished. And, and he recognized that. Well, not Esau. He wasn't too thrilled. We read in verse 34, when Esau heard the words of his father, he cried with an exceeding great, great and bitter cry. And then he said to his father, well, bless me also, my father. And he said, your brother came with deceit. He's taken away your blessing." Esau, the unsaved man, found no way to change his father's mind, and he wept, but he didn't repent. He was just mad. Why was he mad? He got ripped off. What was he losing? The only thing he was upset about was the material double portion blessing that he lost in the process. So Esau's tears were one of bitterness, not of hunger. In fact, he's mentioned also in Hebrews chapter 12, verses 14, 15, 16, and 17, where it says that Esau was a natural man. Um, a natural man, sukikos. It means someone who is governed by his flesh, or he lives only for what he sees and feels, not at all concerned about spiritual things. So he was just upset. And finally, Esau says in verse 36, is he not rightly named Jacob? He's now supplanted me these two times. He's taken away my birthright, and now look, he's taken away my blessing. And he said, haven't you reserved a blessing for me? And Isaac answered, and he said, well, indeed, I've made him your master. <laughs> And all of his brethren I've given to him as servants with grain and wine. I've sustained him. What shall I do now for you, my son? And Esau said to his father, Have you only one blessing, my father? Bless me also, oh, my father. And he lifted up his voice and he wept. And so Isaac, his father, answered. And he said to him, Behold, your dwelling shall be with the fatness of the earth and of the dew of heaven from above. By your sword you'll live. You'll serve your brother. It'll come to pass when you become reckless that you'll break his yoke from your neck. The history of Esau finds him founding the tribe of the Edomites. They were tremendous enemies of Israel. They oftentimes lived subservient to them, uh, dominated by them, but they hated them with a hatred that, that you find throughout the, the, the history. Herod was the last Edomite. So you, that's the Edomite line. So that wasn't much of a blessing. When you get angry, you're going to break his yoke and you're going to be a, an enemy with your brother. Well, then we read in verse 41, so Esau hated Jacob because of the blessing with which his brother had blessed him. And he said in his heart, the days of the mourning for my father are at hand, and then I'm going to kill my brother Jacob. Now Esau believed, like his dad, that his dad was soon going to die. So he said, well, after he dies and we got that 30 days of mourning, I'm going to go kill Jacob. And then I'll be the only heir. We'll see how this works out. It's all coming clear to me now. That was his only concern. Um, there's a scripture in Malachi chapter uh, 1 where we read these words, The burden of the word of the Lord to Israel by Malachi, I have loved you, saith the Lord, yet you say, In what way have you loved us? Was not Esau Jacob's brother, saith the Lord, yet Jacob I have loved, but Esau I have hated and laid waste his mountains and his heritage for the jackals of the wilderness, even though Edom has said we have been impoverished, but we will return and build these desolate places. Um, and people have a problem with that. They say, well, the Lord said he loved Jacob and hated Esau. I've got a problem with it, too. I've got a problem with it, and he loved Jacob. This guy's a crook. 
Jacob is just an absolute crook. You know, people get too worried about Esau. Well, you know, how could he hate Esau? How could he love Jacob? That's my problem right there. I just try to clear that up for you. <laughs> Cheating, conniving, selfish actor in cahoots with his mother to defraud his dad. Help the Lord. God makes sovereign choices, you know, and, and, and he knows our choices as well. So anyway, this is now, Esau now sees his murder, you know, I'm going to kill him. Verse 42, and the words of Esau, her older son, were told to Rebekah, and so she sent and called Jacob, her younger son, and said to him, surely your brother Esau comforts himself concerning you by intending to kill you. Now therefore, my son, obey my voice, arise, flee to my brother Laban in Haran, and stay with him a few days until your brother's fury turns away, or until your brother's anger turns away from you, and he forgets what you have done to him, what you have done to him now. Then I will send and bring you from there. What, why should I be bereaved also of you both in one day? Because she knew she'd lost her one boy in this for sure. And Rebecca said to Isaac as she tries to set it up, I'm weary of my life because of those daughters of Heth. Those are mentioned at the end of chapter 27 that Esau had married. I'm tired of my daughter-in-laws. If Jacob could take a wife from the daughters of Heth too, oh, like these daughters of the land, what good will my life do to me? And so, you know, he asked and, and he agreed that she could send Jacob home to where her family lived, back to Haran. Um, Esau must have mentioned to somebody he was going to kill Jacob because mom heard about it. And notice mom is still scheming and plotting and meddling. I'll pave the way for you with your father. I'll tell him how grieved I am with the son, the daughter's in law. Oh, I can't bear to have you marry one of those kind of women. You got to go get a real woman from our tribe, from our family. Dad will be all about that, you know. So now she sends Jacob packing and he leaves and, and he heads for his uncle Laban's house, hundreds of miles away. Rebecca's brother. Now, note in Rebecca's plans here that this would be a short cooling off period. Oh, a few days, he'll forget what he said. You know, you'll be able to come back. Uh, let me just tell you what lies ahead. For the next 20 years, Jacob doesn't come back. By the time the 20 years have passed, Rebecca has died. Never gets to see this boy on the earth again. So this little scheme, though God's will was accomplished, was also at the, at the cost of reaping what you sowed. So uh, the years that followed, and, and we're not told much about her life at all, hopefully she learned that God can accomplish his will without her help. For the next 20 years, Jacob will, will, will meet his uncle Laban as a worthy adversary. This is the hustler meets the deal maker. And, and these guys are both committed to ripping each other off as much as possible until, you know, they can't live with each other anymore. Jacob is also reaping what he's sowing. Isaac now is at home, blind and old, thinking he's going for 43 years. He'll see his brother. Well, he won't see his son, but he'll meet with his son. And, and, and he's still alive because he's now convinced, like Hebrews 11 says, that God and, and his ways have to be right. So you leave Isaac feeling pretty good about Isaac. Um, Rebecca is living in la-la land. It'll just be a few, few days, honey. You come right back 20 years later. She's died, and he comes back to a home without a mother. Um, years later, just going even further down the road, Jacob's own sons would take his favorite son and claim that he died, right? That, that he was killed by wild animals. And Jacob, the deceiver, who for years now would live this way, has to grieve over the deception uh, and, and finally find out that God had other plans. But all of them seem to be reaping what they're sowing. And it's not worth it to anybody, but, but what a family, you know? And, and what a price to pay. And like I said, by the time you get to the end of chapter 27, only Isaac is sure that God would have his way. Uh, nice to leave Isaac in that condition, because the only thing we learn of him beyond this is that he dies. But the rest are off still scheming, plotting of their own way. So lots to learn from these four folks. But this is a messed up family, isn't it? Don't you feel better about your family now? God can work. I know he can. <laughs> Father, thank you tonight as we sit together for your word to us. And what a, what, a, what a wonderful lesson, Lord, that you've given us. And yet, how easy it is to pass over the lessons that you give us and, and, and not recall next time that they come around. But we pray, Lord, this, this evening that, that we would never come to that position or that belief that somehow that your will to be done would have to be you, you, you'd require our help, and not just our help, but our, our sinful help, our sinful ways, that, that our involvement, because it's your will, can always be justified no matter what it is that we've done. Thank you, Father, that tonight we, we've learned clearly that you don't need our help. 
that you're not looking for us to help you at all. And, and even Isaac, Lord, may we learn from him that there is really no way we're going to defy your will. We can, we can be stubborn and we can outwardly stand for a position that doesn't match your will. But Lord, in the end, your will will be done and ours will be bent or broken. So may we early on and often agree together that God, your will is right. And that if there's something or someone that is in the way of your will, that we don't need to intervene in a sinful manner to somehow help you out. Because though your will will be done in the end, it certainly brings great destruction. Sin has fruit. It always has. It's not good fruit at all. Look, maybe today you're in some of those situations where you know, you know the will of God is one thing, and yet your circumstance seems to be directing you in something entirely different. And you wonder, how in the world is God going to have his way? Well, I can't tell you how, but that he'll have his way, I can assure you. He will have his way. Nothing and no one or any circumstance will keep you from what God wants. And those who would excuse their behavior by saying, well, I know what the Lord wants, but my husband, my wife, my children, my job, my circumstances, it won't fly. God will have his way. We can rest in him. But, but if we will trust him and, and go about things in his manner, then we will find his will with, with great joy, not with great heartbreak like Jacob for 20 years. Just so, you know, such a sneaky, deceitful life. Such a heartbreak life. Esau just furious for... For decades, mom dying without her favorite son at her side, never knowing really how it all turned out. Yet God's will never failed once. So here you are tonight in church so that God might convince you that his ways will work. You can trust him, obey him, and believe him. And if you've been trying to meddle to your own hurt, don't. Let God be God. You just serve him. And let him be God in your life. If you need prayer tonight, you want to know about what it means to know the Lord personally, to be saved, to be born again of his spirit, the pastors are up front tonight. We'd love to talk with you. If you just are in, in, you know, in a need for prayer, please come. And uh, pray with someone tonight that the Lord might accomplish his will in you. Shall we stand?